All righty. Well, um, does ever, anybody ever remember the uh, C Lab 2020 cartoon that used to be on besides me? No? <laughs> well, that was always one of my favorite Saturday morning cartoons. So I titled this Brew Lab 2020. Um, and of course, it's all about testing your water and uh, using the Brew Lab. Um, from those of you familiar with my books, there they are. Uh, these are some of my products that I endorse. I helped develop the Brew Lab with a lot. And this is the Palmer's Water app, which I mentioned to y'all. So if you haven't had a chance to download that, uh, I encourage you to do so after today. It's very, very uh, useful. And I will talk about how to use it later on in the presentation. So why do we adjust brewing water? Well, we do it to achieve our target mash pH. And we do this to improve our beer yield. And because making a better mash makes better wort and makes better beer, okay? To improve beer, we also do it to improve beer flavor. And we do this by adjusting the flavor expression of the beer, uh, balancing the, the sulfate to chloride ratio, the maltiness to hoppiness, and the overall flavor, flavor structure. Uh, which is affected by the total, dissol total dissolved solids and the total mineral level in the water. Um, this is the Lamont Brew Lab, um, and you can use it to quickly measure your calcium, magnesium, total alkalinity, chloride, sulfate, and sodium, uh, and pH. I prefer it over the IDIP uh, water tester. It's more consistent, uh, more repeatable, and um, the resolution is 10 ppm, which is a much more uh, realistic resolution for this type of testing than the claimed 1, p 1 ppm resolution that you get with the IDIP, okay? Hey, John, I, I think yeah. um, the uh, annotation maybe needs to be turned off from your side. I, I tried turning it off from mine. Annotation. Um, that's all okay. the hearts and arrows. So at the top of the screen, there's a view options, and there should be an option there to say more and annotate and then turn off annotate. OK. Just disable um, attendee annotate, annotation. There we go. It doesn't seem to be something available to the host for some reason. OK. Um, it, yeah. I. Yeah, okay, show. Huh. All right. I names annotators. Okay, well, I think I've done taking care of that. Perfect. Oh. Okay, so, sorry <laughs> about that. No worries. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, one ppm is equivalent to one milligram per liter. Um, and there's the basis for that. Uh, different you know, reports will talk about milligrams per liter or, or parts per million. They are equivalent units of measurement, even if they aren't exactly the same. They're close enough. Oh, yeah, touch that. Okay, so water hardness. Um, we hear a lot about water hardness, good, bad, and, and otherwise. From a brewer's point of view, hardness is good. Uh, we want calcium and magnesium in our beer. It's a very important uh, enzyme and biochemical cofactor. Um, so it also helps us adjust our pH, which is uh, very important. We talk about permanent hardness and temporary hardness. Permanent hardness is calcium and magnesium that are dissolved from high solubility salts, such, such as sulfates and chlorides. Um, temporary hardness is calcium and magnesium and that's dissolved from bicarbonate and carbonate, uh, very low solubility salts. And so they call it temporary hardness because when you heat or boil the water, carbon dioxide comes out of solution, the equilibrium shifts and the calcium and magnesium bicarbonate carbonate settle back out in solid form. So it's temporary. Um, when we talk about soft water, we are simply saying that it is not hard. It doesn't have high 
concentrations of calcium and magnesium. It doesn't say anything about the alkalinity level. And the alkalinity level is what is really um, the, the bug in the system, what makes it difficult to brew with different waters. So, so alkalinity, total alkalinity is the sum of the carbonate species in the water that come from limestone. Alkalinity buffers a, the decrease in mash pH, which makes the beer less acidic but duller. Um, carbon, there's two forms, carbonate, which is the negative two, and the bicarbonate, which is minus one. Alkalinity, uh, if you think back to the previous slide, is roughly equivalent to the temporary hardness. It is uh, a measure of the dissolved bicarbonate in the water. And this is why the brewing textbooks will say we, you know, we want to boil to get rid of temporary hardness before we brew with the water. Well, we're not trying to get rid of the hardness, we're trying to get rid of the alkalinity that's associated with it. Okay. Once we've reduced the temporary hardness from the water, then we can add hardness back as calcium salts to, you know, more permanent hardness to bring to improve the water. Eric, the, uh, else about, do you know of a way I can get rid of the annotation? <laughs> I was also looking into that. Um, are you able to right click on them and delete them or something? Uh, or maybe? Uh, it just advances the presentation. Or at the top under annotation, are you able to say maybe clear Erase. annotations? Clear, clear, clear all drawings. There we go. Perfect. Uh, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Good. All right. So, so now that we know how to turn off annotation, that's something I learned about Zoom today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we talk about total alkalinity and total hardness as calcium carbonate. And this is due, it's a very old unit. It's a way of describing chemistry before we had uh, pH and other measures. Um, basically, it's a way of assessing the propensity to form water scale, you know, in the pipes, blocking the pipes. Um, so that's why you see uh, total alkalinity described as calcium carbonate. Uh, it's a unit of equivalence and equivalent weight is equal to the molecular weight of a substance divided by its valence. So in the case of calcium carbonate has a molecular weight of 100, uh, a valence of two, calcium plus two, carbonate minus two. You divide 100 by two and you get an equivalent weight of 50. Um, and that's probably more than you need to know at this point, but that is the explanation behind it. And I probably explain it better in the water book. Okay, moving on. Um, so, and you'll see ion concentrations such as calcium and magnesium and bicarbonate uh, expressed as calcium carbonate. Um, you'll see calcium hardness as calcium carbonate. And you'll also see calcium just as uh, parts per million. So this is how that conversion works. If you see 40 ppm of calcium ion, uh, that equates to 100 ppm of calcium hardness as calcium carbonate. And that's how you can uh, convert between the various uh, unit forms. Okay, so testing water with the Lamont Brew Lab. The first test you do is to measure the total hardness as calcium carbonate. Then you take another water sample and measure the calcium hardness as calcium carbonate. And then you subtract the calcium hardness from the total hardness to give you the magnesium hardness as calcium carbonate. Um, and then after that, you measure your total alkalinity as calcium carbonate and subtract, and this will give you your residual alkalinity for the water. Those three tests take about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how, how dexterous you are with a eyedropper. Uh, but they're easy to do. And if you miscount, it's easy to start over and, and do it again. Um, the next test is a chloride test. It's also a dropper test and pretty straightforward to do. You're, you're doing a titration. You're looking for a color change in your sample as you drip the little eyedropper of reagent in. 
The sulfate test is a little, little trickier. Um, it is a visual turbidity test um, where you measure how cloudy the sample has become. And fortunately at this level, uh, you know, home technology uh, or, you know, uh, tests are easy to conduct at home. There's really not a better way to do it. What you do is you uh, drop, you crush a tablet and mix it with water. And then you compare how cloudy uh, and how much it obscures your test panel. So you look through the vial, down through the vial at this, uh, at these targets. And then you look along this side and say, how gray has this target become due to the cloudiness of the water? And you're looking for, you know, um, 50 parts per million, 50, 100, 150, 200. You're just trying to ballpark it. Um, you don't need to be any closer than that. You know, if you know, you know that your water either has less than 50 parts per million of sulfate, it's very clear, or it's about 50 or between 50 and 100 or between 100 and 150, you know, gives you a ballpark to work from. And that way, you know approximately how much sulfate you want, you may want to add for an IPA, for example. Okay, it's not the best test in the world, but uh, with practice, it becomes very usable and I don't have any problem using it. Um, and I wanna emphasize that high resolution really isn't necessary when you're testing your water. Um, you know, the dropper tests have a resolution of plus or minus 10 parts per million. You know, one drop is 10 ppm. And you know, like I say, you're looking for a color change in the, in the indicator. The sulfate test therefore is about plus or minus 25. Um, and once you've done the other uh, five tests, the hardness, alkalinity, and um, sulfate and chloride, you, you can um, use math to determine the sodium level. Um, you can't measure sodium by itself. What you do is you add up the electrovalences uh, equivalents of the other compounds and then subtract to get the sodium level. Sodium should be uh, in, all, in most cases um, between zero and 50 ppm typically. Um, maybe if you're in a region where you have brackish water, you could expect a higher value. Or if you're in a very high hardness area and you use a home water softener or the local water utility uses uh, softening to bring the hardness down to prevent scale in their pipes, you might see higher sodium levels uh, between 50 and 100. Um, and I'll talk more about um, ion levels in just a second. If you get water reports from ward labs, uh, if you send, send your water out for uh, analysis, you'll often, instead of sulf sulfate, you'll see water um, sulfate listed as sulfur, as S. And to convert it, you simply multiply by three. Uh, here's the math. You divide by the equivalent weight of sulfur and then multiply the, by the equivalent weight of sulfate. And when all is said and done, it's a factor of three. 40 ppm as sulfur equals 120 ppm as sulfate. And as brewers, we're more interested in sulfate than sulfur. And the same can, um, can happen with sodium and chloride levels if they're given as equivalents in saline as, as table salt. So you'll have to make the appropriate conversions there. Are there any questions so far? No? Okay. All right, uh, let me expand this. There we go. Um, so how does water affect beer flavor? Well, 
The residual alkalinity of the water is one of the cornerstones of establishing the mash pH. The mash pH drives the beer pH and beer pH drives flavor expression. Um, I often talk with my about my spaghetti sauce example. You know how you go to the store, you buy a jar of ragu spaghetti sauce, very bland, sweet spaghetti sauce. The kids love it, but for an adult, not very interesting. Not there's just it's not it lacks complexity, it lacks brightness, and so on. Whereas if you go to your local um, paleo organic Italian restaurant where the tomatoes were just fresh squeezed that morning by nuns, you know, and they make their very own marinara sauce and it comes out and it is bright and tomato acidic and you can feel it etching your teeth. Um, to have the best spaghetti sauce, you want a compromise of those two extremes. You want a spaghetti sauce that has uh, tomato richness and depth as well as some tomato brightness. You get the best of both worlds. Well, it's the same with your beer. If the beer pH is too low, too acidic, flavors tend to become focused. If the beer pH is too high, the flavors become too broad and the beer flavor gets muddy, for lack of a better word. They're just, there's, there's nothing exciting about it. There's no balance and complexity to it. It's just bland. So that's how beer pH affects beer flavor expression. Now, the other two factors for how water affects beer flavor are your seasoning balance and the amount of seasoning. These are the sulfate to chloride ratio and the total dissolved solids. More sulfate in the water tends to make the beer drier, makes the hop character more assertive. More chloride makes the beer uh, malt character rounder, fuller, and sweeter tasting. And if you've ever added table salt to a beer, you can experience that. The, the malt character becomes sweeter tasting, and that's, that's part of the effect of sodium and chl chloride uh, on beer flavor. And of course, you know, going back to cooking, because brewing is cooking, um, the amount of seasoning that you add to your water, the amount of salt has an effect on the amount of beer that the beer flavors are experienced, okay? And the total dissolved solids is proportional to your calcium salt concentrations because we're typically adding calcium salts to our water to raise the, you know, to moderate the pH and a variety of other reasons, okay? Click, oh, there we go. So know your source water. For you all there in Toronto, I imagine the water comes from the lake, um, fairly low in minerals, maybe high in organics during the summer, maybe heavily chlorinated during the summer. And so you'll probably wanna do some carbon filtration to remove the taste and odor compounds from these organic uh, contaminants. If you're in an area where the water comes from the ground, from the aquifers, uh, that water tends to be high in minerals, but low in organics. And if the, min if the water is high in minerals, it tends to be high in alkalinity. And you'll often need ion exchange, such as softening or reverse osmosis to reduce that alkalinity before you can effectively, effectively brew with it. It's important to know how your source water is disinfected. Does it use chlorine or does it use chloramine? Did Dan, does your source water change during the year, you know, winter to summer? Um, here in California, water sources can change weekly, depending on where it's most available from. Could be the Colorado River, could be the Hetch Hetchy Mountains up by, by, by uh, Northern California, um, could be a local aquifer. Um, they change it all the time, which makes brewing beer consistently kind of challenging. Okay, two groups of ions, those that affect pH, calcium, magnesium, and total alkalinity, otherwise known as bicarbonate, and those that affect flavor, sodium, chloride, and, so, and sulfate. Lots of people come to me and say, oh, you know, my water is very hard. 
um, or it's, you know, it's got a high pH and it's really bad to brew with. And I say, well, send me your water report. Let's look at it. And often they're all their mineral concentrations are 20 ppm or less, which is very low concentrations, really. Anything from zero to 50 ppm, 50 ppm is a low concentration. 50 to 100 is medium, 100 to 150 is high. Over 150 tends to be a problem. And there are people in um, Alaska and Northern Canada uh, Western Canada that, that have groundwater with uh, alkalinity in the 200, 250, 300 ppm range. You know, they sit on top of a limestone aquifer and they have very alkaline water, which is nearly impossible to brew with because you've got to neutralize all that alkalinity with acid. And using that much acid to counter that much alkalinity usually ends up taking on the flavor of the acid. Okay, but that's an aside. Sulfate to chloride ratio. The seasoning effect, dryness versus fullness, hoppiness versus maltiness. The, we talk about the ratio, but it is not magic. 40 to 10 does not equal 400 to 100. But the ratio is a good way of you know, conceptualizing it in your mind. Um, high sulfate, you know, high sulfate to chloride ratios for IPAs, very useful tool, make that beer nice and dry and really pop, you know, in terms of bitterness when you take a sip. The nice thing about sulfate too is that it, it makes that hop character fade quickly. So the bit, you know, it's intensely bitter up front, but then that bitterness fades off your palate quickly. Low, um, low sulfate, uh, especially high pH and low sulfate tends to make that bitter character linger on the palate more. All right, um, here's some suggested examples of uh, sulfate to chloride for IPA and, and NEPA um, or New England, hazy IPAs. 250 ppm maximum sulfur sulfate, I think, uh, 50 chloride. And for then the hazy IPA, 150 ppm of chloride maximum, maybe 200 um, and 50 uh, ppm for sulfate. You don't want to try to maximize both. You end up with a beer that tastes minerally. Going back to light versus heavy seasoning. If you think about these three beer styles, Bohemian Pilsner, uh, big soft, you know, bitter beer, German Pilsner, a little more crisp, a little more, uh, you know, a uh, little more bitter than the Bohemian, um, then Dortmunder Export. Uh, what tastes like a big, robust beer is actually, you know, lower gravity beer, lower gravity style than the other two. But it doesn't taste like, and it's because the extra mineral character of the water helps support those beer flavors, gives those flavors more structure. And so it tastes like a more robust uh, beer. And here you can see examples of their water profiles. Pilsen, uh, total dissolved solids of about 50. Munich, and this is after boiling, um, total dissolved solids of about 150. Dortmund, about 775. You can kind of see the order of magnitude increase in the total dissolved solids as you move uh, through those three waters. Okay, and that is part of what differentiates those styles. A big soft beer to a more assertive beer to a smaller yet bolder beer style. And that's what we mean by mineral structure. Okay, water pH is not important. Um, it's not important because pH is a measure of chemical equilibrium. It is a measurement of the hydrogen ions and concentration in solution, but it is essentially a way to measure the chemical equilibrium of a solution. And in the case of water, you are essentially measuring the balance of hardness to alkalinity. Okay, so you can have a, P, a water pH of nine, 
for two completely different water characters, low mineral character, high mineral character, same pH value, same balance. What's really important for a brewer is the mash pH and the wort pH, okay? Not the water pH. The key point for control of pH throughout the brewing process is during mashing. This is due to the major influence that can be exerted at this stage on the content and format of the buffer systems that will operate subsequently in the wort and beer. Great quote from Dr. Dave Taylor. And it really, it really points home to how we as brewers can take control of our brews. Here's how the pH kind of progresses during the brewing process. We start out here in the mash, um, 5.2 to 5.6. And um, in the mash, calcium and magnesium are reacting with malt phosphates. Um, those, that reaction produces hydrogen ions and the pH drops. And this is one of the mechanisms that's responsible for the pH of the mash dropping from the water's pH of say eight or nine down to our target pH range of five, two to five, six. It's this reaction and the release of hydrogen ions. Now, uh, another aspect of that is you have specialty grains that are uh, relatively acidic and those provide organic acids and buffers that also bring the pH down. But during the mash, these, this calcium phosphate reaction continues to happen and from the beginning of the mash to the end of the end of the mash, provided you have sufficient calcium, your pH can drop by one or two tenths. So by the end of the mash, we're about five to five, four. We go into the boil. During the boil, um, lots of chemistry happen, happening. Um, proteins coagulate, buffer compounds settle out. Um, we add uh, alpha acids to the wort and the pH can drop by another three tenths during the boil. During fermentation, the yeast are taking in amino acids. Uh, they're producing organic acids during fermentation. They're excreting protons and pH tends to drop by about another half. So this is how we get from our mash pH down to our typical beer pH of four to 4.6. Um, and especially for a commercial brewer, monitoring pH at, every each, at each stage of the brewing process is the best tool you have for main, you know, monitoring consistency of your, your brews. When you see the pH change uh, and change from the norm, then you know something in your process has changed. So in general, a lower beer pH focuses and brightens the malt and hop flavors. A lower beer pH tends to work better for single malt pale beers, such as Helles, uh, Kolsch, pale ales, and so on. Um, a lower beer pH in a dark beer tends to um, focus the malt flavors into a singular roast character. It's not a bad character. It's not, I don't mean to say that it's, you know, bitter or acrid or, you know, something like that. It's just singular. It's focused. Okay. Now, if you take that same beer, that same dark beer and raise the beer pH a few tenths, that higher pH tends to broaden and open up the malt character of the beer. And um, we've done, over the years, we've done a couple of experiments with stouts and other styles and porters. And it's amazing how much it does open up the malt character of the beer. Uh, the a difference of two tenths in beer pH um, from singular roast character to a more complex malt character where you can taste the caramel, you can taste some hints of smoke, you get some coffee and chocolate, all these, you know, different flavors playing off each other. And it's simply due to that uh, beer pH effect. Now, 
The other problem with beer pH for pale beers is their pH rises to 4.5, 4.6, and even higher with extensive dry hopping. That, that uh, pH causes the malt and hop flavors to meld and just become muddied. And your bitterness tends to become kind of dull and harsh and very lingering on the palate. Uh, whereas with the lower beer pH, those two characters be more separated. Um, so watch your, your pH for your pale beers, for your IPAs and so on. Very good tool for improving them. My co-author in the water book, Colin Kaminsky, uh, was intrigued by this assertion that I made. Uh, and so he started looking at his data and he had, you know, as a professional brewer, had years of data, pH data on his beers. And what he found with his pale ale was that uh, at a boil pH, um, his hop character varied from strong and harsh to full and rich to dull and flaccid at the very lower pHs. And looking at the beer pH, 4.4 kind of gave his pale ale kind of a soft and soapy character. 4.2 he considered to be normal, whereas 4.0 came out rather sharp and crisp. You know, more so than what he, you know, his, his uh, preferred uh, expression of the style. So um, just some data points there to show that you know, two tenths pH can have uh, quite a noticeable effect on beer flavor. So every beer recipe was is going to have an optimum beer pH in generally in that range of four to four six, where that beer should fully express its malt flavors and aromas, its hop flavors and aromas, and its fermentation character yeast flavors and aromas. If you can't taste or smell everything, then you're probably not at the optimum beer pH. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's useful to think about. You know, if it's not tasting the way you envisioned, check the pH, think about how you might adjust that pH for next time. Uh, here is the brew cube, which is in the 2017 edition of How to Brew. Um, and the purpose in doing this is to help you, everyone understand how beer parameters and water parameters relate to one another. So here I defi define the beer parameters by uh, beer color, beer flavor balance, and beer structure. And those correspond to three water parameters, residual alkalinity, sulfate to chloride, and calcium level. Now, as I said earlier, structure is proportional to your calcium concentration because we're typically adding calcium salts to, you know, improve, in, to change the sulfate level, to change the chloride level in the, in the beer, as well as adding the calcium that we need uh, for good beer clarity and other reactions. So if we define a beer style, say we want to brew a pale beer that's hoppy um, and one that is soft, well, then we can look here on the cube and say, okay, for soft beer structure, we're looking for about a calcium level of 50. For hoppy, we're looking, for example, at a four to one sulfate to chloride ratio. And for pale, we're looking at a negative 100 level of residual alkalinity, for example. These values aren't written in stone, um, they're guidelines. But the important thing is to understand how beer style and water parameter relate to one another. Now here's uh, some suggested salt additions to reverse osmosis water in grams per gallon. Uh, going back to the beer cube, um, we can make a pale hoppy water by using one gram per gallon of calcium sulfate and a half gram per, per gallon of calcium chloride and no baking soda. This gives us near 100 calcium, uh, no sodium, uh, about 150 ppm of sulfate, about 64 chloride, 
no alkalinity and a, a, re, a residual alkalinity of about minus 70. For pale balanced, we, we use equal amounts of calcium sulfate and calcium chloride, gives us a near one-to-one -one balance of sulfate to chloride, same residual alkalinity, same calcium level. Pale malty, you just reverse them. Again, now we've got this half to one roughly uh, sulfate to chloride level. Actually, it's not half to one, but it's close. You can see how that those proportions change. Amber and dark, we simply add a half gram per gallon or one gram per gallon of baking soda to the water. And that goes, takes us from minus 70 to near zero to plus 80 residual alkalinity. So the point is not to say that these are the, you know, the waters that you should brew with, but you know, to show you how easy it is to adjust water character for the different styles of beer you want to brew. A um, couple years ago, we did some experiments at a BYO uh, boot camp, and we did some mini mashes in styrofoam cups. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, it gave very uh, good results. I had three grain bills, base malt, base malt plus 10% crystal, and base malt plus 10% crystal, crystal and 10% roast. We used uh, four liters per kilogram water to grist ratio which is about two quarts per pound. And you can see the progression of pH as we, you know, the, the base malt started out about five, seven with the pale hoppy water, pale malty water, same residual alkalinity, a little bit different, five, six, went to amber, came up to five, eight, went to dark uh, with higher residual alkalinity, came up to 6.3. If you take one grain bill, such as the uh, dark malty, and you go from, um, sorry, one water, the dark malty water, and you go from pale to amber to dark grain bills, you can see how the addition of the two specialty malts changes the pH as well. So it works. <laughs> okay, so how do I, John Palmer, adjust water for beer style? Um, well, here's an example of my uh, water at home. It's, um, you know, basically a dark balanced soft water, 40 ppm of calcium, that's less than 50. 10 magnesium, 120 alkalinity, that's high. Uh, 40 sulfate, 35 chloride, pretty balanced, low concentrations low concentration of sodium, residual alkalinity of about 86. So, you know, it kind of falls in this region in terms of beer color and structure. Um, so I think about, you know, what kind of best brew with that? Well, it'd be a dark, a dark amber to dark beer. If I want to brew um, a pale ale or an IPA, pale hoppy medium um, struck, kind of beer, I'm gonna add calcium. And um, for medium, I'm gonna try bring my calcium level up to about 100 ppm. So the first thing I'll do is add one gram per gallon of calcium sulfate to the water. And that takes me from 40 ppm up to 100 ppm. Everything else being the same, except for now our sulfate level is increased from 40 to 187. And 187 ppm is quite good for most pale ales and IPAs. You'll get a good assertive uh, hop character with that much sulfate. Okay, but that's only brought our residual alkalinity from 86 down to 42. So not quite as low uh, as we like to go. Um, now we're kind of in the amber hoppy medium category, in other words. So how do we bring that lower? Well, we'd neutralize with acid. And the water app will do these calculations for you. It gives you, um, a, you know, you tell it 
what volume of, of water you're trying to treat and what target residual alkalinity you're trying to reach. And it will say you can use, you know, 15 milliliters of this acid or five milliliters of this acid to do that. Okay, in this case, it comes out to about 0.75 milliliters per gallon of using the 88% lactic acid. And that drops us down to a residual alkalinity of minus 75. And it drops our alkalinity from 120 down to three. Now, when it comes to actually doing the adjustments to your brewing water, um, I take those numbers and I acidify the water first. Okay, that's the first thing to do. Put in the acid, stir the water, mix it up. When you add acid to water, you're going to generate fizz. You're going to, it's going to convert the bicarbonate to carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide is going to come out of solution. If it doesn't come out of solution, if you were to just leave that water like that overnight, still that carbon dioxide would dissolve back in and you'd be right back where you started. Okay. With enough time. Uh, so heat up the water, stir it, vent that carbon dioxide, and you'll reduce your alkalinity. Um, that will also bring the pH of the water down and make it easier to dissolve your salts. Um, calcium sulfate in particular is kind of slow to dissolve, takes a lot of stirring. And so if you add it to acidified water or to the mash, it dissolves much more readily. When do you add salts? Well, your first priority is always achieving your target mash pH. Um, and once you've done that, um, then you can worry about, you know, do I have the sulfate to chloride level that I'm looking for? Um, or if I've added half my salts and I'm already at my target mash pH, May I should just leave it alone and then I'll add the rest of the salts later at the boil kettle. You can do that as well. Um, your first priority is, is achieving that target mash pH. Um, then the second priority is worrying about flavor balance and structure. So here's the screens from my water app. And um, it's very much like my spreadsheet. The first step, you select a style of beer that you're going to brew, um, and it will give you suggested um, mineral levels to target. You enter your source water data, and you can store that and recall it for later. So you can store your home profile, you can store um, a reverse osmosis profile, or a, um, a store-bought water profile and save those in the, in the app uh, for later use. Then you input the volume of water that you're going to treat, either gallons or liters, it can do both, um, and the target residual alkalinity that you're trying to achieve. Any source water dilution you're doing, say with distilled water, um, and then you go to your salt additions and you can add, you know, grams per gallon or sorry, total grams of salt to the volume of water that you're treating and it will give you the concentrations that result. Same thing with acid additions. Um, if you've done your salt additions to bring your calcium level up to say 100 and your sulfate and chloride levels where you want them, Maybe you now you still have some uh, residual alkalinity that's too high. You can use the acid additions. And like I said, it will estimate those for you. Once you input those, um, it gives you your adjusted water results that like you see here with your final concentration versus the suggested guideline for your style um, right on down. So useful little lap. Here's kind of how go, it works, um, playing it out. We select our style. We're going to say do an Oktoberfest. Marison gives you these guidelines. You input your water. And here I have my uh, Los Angeles brewing water from this little 
save icon. Um, I'm going to target a residual alkalinity of 25. Um, and I'm using gallons. I'm using eight gallons of water that I'm treating all at once in my hot liquor tank. And it says I need to reduce my alkalinity by 61 and gives me this rough guide as to beer color that's appropriate for that amount of alkalinity. Next, um, I'm going to dilute my source water 50%. And that brings my mineral levels down to these values. Calcium went from 40 to 20. Now I'm going to add salts. And I'm adding three grams of, of gypsum, three grams of calcium chloride. And that makes a contribution of 50 ppm of calcium, 55 sulfate, and 48 chloride. Um, it says that my adjusted residual alkalinity is now seven. And looking at acid additions, it recommends um, an estimated acid addition of zero because this value is close enough to our residual alkalinity target. Now, if we wanted to, and then here's step seven, our adjusted results. If we wanted to bring our uh, residual alkalinity up to say 25, we could add one gram of baking soda. And I don't have that value here, but you can play with it yourself. So the nice thing about the app is you can go back and forth between the two steps, you know, add a gram here, subtract a gram there, see what the result is, you know, um, I do a little acid addition, see what that result is, go back and forth. It makes it very easy to, you know, play with your water adjustments until you have it dialed into where you think you want it. When do you add salts? Well, again, mash pH is the thing. So you can either add them all to the hot liquor tank or you can fill up your mash ton and then add them to the water or you can dough in and then add your salts. But the priority is to get your mash pH right. You can always add more uh, sulfate or chloride at the kettle if you want to change your calcium levels or tweak it. And you can do post adjustments as well. Um, years past, I've brewed, you know, some lagers and so on that just didn't have that right, nice base malt brightness that I was looking for. Um, and, you know, it uh, was like, I think, two and a half or three milliliters of lactic acid to the keg really brightened up that malt character nicely. Just that little change in beer pH uh, really really made a big improvement. So uh, be aware that with salt additions, you know, to the final beer, you're going to end up adding more salt than you would if you had done it earlier in the process. It uh, a little goes a long way early in the process. It takes more later in the process to have the same effect. If you are capping adding your dark grain last. Um, you know, that's, that's valid. It works. Um, you need to make the decision on, you know, are you going to use your roast malt separately or include them in the mash? Um, if you're doing it separately, then you need less alkalinity in your mash water. If you're doing it together, then you're going to need more alkalinity in your mash water to balance the, the acidity of those malts. Your pH target is the same no matter what you do. You're still looking for this for a dark beer somewhere between 5.4 and 5.6 to help open up that specialty malt character. Looks like Eric's falling asleep. Um, oh, there he is. Okay. Um, you know, and it also is a factor of how much roast flavor do you want in that beer? Um, if you're doing capping, that short contact time, you're going to need more grain to get the same amount of roast character in the beer than you would if you use a smaller amount of grain, you know, during the entire mash. You get more flavor extraction the longer that you're in there. And again, the pH of that wort is going to, you know, in large part determine the flavor expression of that beer. 
And that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks, John. I wasn't following this. I was writing down questions. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> but uh, I, I was telling people in the chat that uh, if they have a question, um, we can use the hands up feature. So oh. um, there is there is a hands up feature on Zoom where you can just say raise hand and uh, it'll bring it'll bring your, yourself to the top of the list. Um, so feel free to do that. Uh, but while we wait, I see John has unmuted. John Koopman has unmuted himself. So I guess, John, do you have a question? Oh, I don't, uh, sorry. I thought I thought you had to unmute yourself after the presentation. You don't have to. <laughs> well, you, you, so you, you just unmute when you want to talk. Is that it? Or? Yep, exactly. Oh, OK. So how do I, I guess I mute again then, right? Uh, I have a quick qualifying question. Sure. Uh, you, you, you know, you obviously, and this is a very interesting for, for people playing with new styles. You talk quite a bit about sulfate and chloride ratios in terms of hoppiness, but I mean, mm -hmm. many of us define hoppiness in you know whether it be bitterness, flavor, or aroma, and um, I would imagine those things play out a little differently. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, um, the sulfate in the water helps. Uh, make the hop character more assertive. It makes the beer drier uh, in terms of its mouth feel and body. And so, um, yeah, I'm primarily referring to bitterness when I talk about, you know, sulfate enhancing the hop character, but it, it can uh, affect the, the flavor of the beer quite a bit. You know, again, it's that dryness versus fullness uh, character. Um, in hazy IPAs, New England IPAs, um, you typically flip the chloride, and the sulfate and chloride. You're at, you know, 150 chloride, 50 sulfate. Um, and that tends, and along with a lower uh, beer pH, to make that beer taste more juicy, more, more like a fruit, fruit juice character than a beer. Um, and... I, sulfate doesn't really enhance hop aroma so much, but it does affect the flavor perception on your palate. I saw Max had his hand up first, uh, and since I told people to use hands, okay. um, why don't we go ahead and give Max uh, a shot at a question? Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, John. Um, as far as trying to adjust chemistry, I've got a, uh, a little um, electric uh, pH sensor that I've been playing around with and I've been using the brew and water spreadsheet okay. as well to to try to calculate what adjustments I should be making. I find okay. when I make the adjustments based on my municipal water supply, um, I'm not able to actually get uh, the expected value at the end of it based on the grains that are going in, in the water. Um, right. So is it possible that like there's something that I'm either not getting correctly from the municipality or more likely that um, there's some other buffering factor that I'm not properly calculating here? Well, it's, it's, not a it's not a matter of you doing anything wrong. Uh, let me just say that. Uh, yes, the, the water report that you're getting from the mu municipality uh, could be a source of error. Very often, you know, annual water reports are a list of averages. And so during the year, particular times here, those values can change appreciably, and that can have an effect on your eventual pH. Um, the other flaw in the system of estimating mash pH with Bruin Water or Beer Smith or some of the other you know, brewer's friend calculators is that there's just not enough data on the titratable acidity of the malts, the specific malts. Um, that you would be using in your beer to know how they are going to, how much buffering they are going to have versus your water. So that's why my calculator doesn't estimate mash pH. It just simply says, this is the effect that you're having on the residual alkalinity of the water um, and kind of leaves it at that because the, ma the mash pH is going to be you know, the, the equilibrium of your water chemistry and your grain bill. So um, with time, as you play with these three factors and I compare it to balancing the triangle, you know, uh, residual alkalinity, uh, grain bill, 
the specialty malt uh, quantity and grain bill base malt quantity, those three factors balance to create the, ma the mash pH. Awesome, thanks. All right, I, see, I think Kevin Sanders was the second one with his hand up. Um, so Kevin, why don't, why don't you go ahead? Great, uh, thank you very much, John. No uh, worries. I was wondering if you might be able to comment on um, if water adjustment salts and minerals have any effect during a sparge, like if all of these salts should be added for a mash or if in sparge water, all we need to care about is the pH and not so much the salt adjustments. Um, hold that thought. I'm going to quick take a quick uh, sparge myself. I'll be right back. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just, I was gonna say, well, John steps away. Um, if anyone hasn't seen the Toronto water summary, um, uh, we do have mins, uh, maxes and averages. And if all, also if anyone hasn't seen on, on the club website, which I'm actually in the process of updating right now. And of course, apparently I need to turn off annotation. Uh, um, so we do have uh, the, since they publish it once a year, um, we, we, we also publish um, the latest unofficial results, which I get through email um, whenever I remember to email them. <laughs> Are we seeing a lot of variability on these? Um, what was the question? Historically, what's the variability look like? Because I tracked them for a while and didn't see much, but I haven't looked for a while now. Yeah, I mean, so, so uh, the reason why I don't update it that often is if you take a look at the, um, the min and uh, waiting for that thing to go back up, go back to this page. If you look at the min and max and average, um, for most years, it doesn't very much. And it's always within like a couple of PPM of each other. Mm. That's what so, I tr so our lake water is actually very consistent around here. Yeah, yeah lake water would be. Yep. Journal, oh, journal back. Way I'll stop water. sharing. <laughs> Uh, uh, going back to Kevin's question, yeah, um, the way I treat water is I tend to treat it all at once in my hot liquor tank. Um, and that way I just brew with that water, you know, for the entire brew, mash and sparge. Um, a lot of professional brewers, uh, craft brewers, you know, don't have the luxury of a, a very large hot liquor tank to brew from, or they have the constraint that they need to brew you know, three or four times in a row consecutively to fill a fermenter and they never fully drain their hot liquor tank and heat it, you know, and have reheat it and so on. So uh, in that case, it's, it's easier, more convenient to uh, bring over a quantity of water for the mash, adjust that in the mash ton, and then sparge with untreated water or you know, do some acidification, you know, dosing during the sparge at the mash slaughter ton, um, rather than treating all the water ahead of time. Um, the things to, if you're brewing with relatively soft or low, I should say, if you're brewing with low alkalinity water like the lake water, um, then chances are you're not going to have a big pH shift during the sparge. You're not going to have a big pH rise, which could give, give rise to uh, tannin astringency. Um, so you don't really have to worry about uh, adjusting the sparge water much. Western Canada, where alkalinity is a problem, um, that's very much a consideration. And um, I know brewers that, you know, sparge exclusively with RO water in that case to, to get around that alkalinity problem. All right. Thank I you very Guillaume much. Was, oh, thank you. I think Guillaume was the next one with his hand up. So um, Guillaume, go ahead. Sure. So you said that the final beer pH is really what matters most. So does that mean that we should be adjusting our pH like post-boil, post-fermentation even? You can, you can. Um, you know, it, it depends on your recipe and your, your water supply and so on. Um, I, from a consistency point of view, um, I, know, I know brewers that do, they, they focus on the end of mash pH 
because they know they've got it dialed in pretty well at the beginning. They focus on the end of mash pH where it's pretty consistent. And they say, what's my pH going into the boil kettle? They may do some acid adjustment there to tweak it if they say, okay, and it's a little bit high today, different batch of malt or whatever, you know, it came out a little different. Um, in the case of dry hopping, where you get pH rise due to the dry hopping, um, becoming common practice to acidify the beer, you know, post fermentation um, to uh, adjust that pH back down, you know, improve uh, hop flavor and clarity and, uh, you know, uh, flavor stability and so on thereby. So, yeah, you, you can do it as needed. Thanks, Guillaume. Um, I think Daryl was the next one with his hand up. Uh, so, Daryl, you want to go ahead? I was recently uh, looking at water profiles for a Schwartz beer that I was going to brew, and I was looking at some of the profiles that were on the Brewkaiser website. Yeah. And one, one of the things that he recommended adding was uh, magnesium chloride. And I'd never heard of that being added before because it's not like a common addition. Right. I was wondering if you have any experience using magnesium chloride and also like maybe just um, what like magnesium will actually add to the beer. Like, cause I was just kind of like following along with like his profile and kind of trying to hit it without uh, going too crazy with sulfite. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, there, there is an antagonism between calcium and magnesium uh, from the yeast cells point of view. If you're doing lots of calcium salt additions to your water um, for brewing West Coast IPAs, for example, um, then, or if you're doing lots of calcium chloride additions for, for a hazy IPA, you know, another example, the lots of calcium in the water will prevent the yeast from being able to access the magnesium in the water. Magnesium is very important from the yeast cells point of view for overall yeast health and fermentation health. Um, and so I was just discussing this uh, last week with, uh, with some guys uh, at Master Brewers. Um, and we feel that um, a good ballpark range for magnesium concentration during fermentation is 100 to 150 ppm of magnesium in the fermentation. Um, there are some published uh, wort analyses that say you get, now this is just like two data points, you know, about 75 ppm will come from the malts into the wort, you know, into the wort. Um, so most water supplies only have five to 10 ppm magnesium. So that would only bring you up to like, you know, 85, 90, maybe 100 ppm, depending on all these, you know, different malts and variables and everything else that go into this. Uh, so you could add uh, magnesium chloride as a way to boost the magnesium level um, for good fermentation and boost the chloride levels for these, you know, non or these non hop forward beers like uh, Kolsch and Hellas. So yeah, I think magnesium chloride, is, I haven't used it myself. Um, it, it does dissolve very easily. Um, I think it absorbs water easily. So you have to keep it in an airtight container um, so you can weigh it effectively, but it, it is um, a good addition to make. And, and as well, I think our guidelines on magnesium additions should be revised. We've, you know, we've cautioned against going over, I think, 30 or 40 ppm of magnesium in the water. But based on the fact that we're looking for 150 in the fermentation, I think we can easily go up to 50 ppm in the water without hurting anything, without getting any sour, bitter flavors as a result. So, so it's more of a yeast health thing than rather a flavor contribution thing then. Right. Now, the, Colin Kaminsky, the co-author of Water, um, he told me, you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago that 
his he always added magnesium sulfate to his porters because he felt that the higher magnesium level around 30 ppm in the water uh, helped brought out something in the dark malt flavor and his porters were excellent interesting to wonder if that improvement in flavor was due to better yeast health during fermentation or a, a flavor effect of the ion with the dark malts. I don't know, but his, his beers were very good. I see, thanks Gerald for your question. I see John Koopmans is next up. Uh, so John, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Okay, um, thank you very much. That was a very informative presentation. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Um, there's a lot of uh, like there's a lot of um, uh, careful work done in, in trying to get the exact water profile for a particular beer, and I'm just wondering. Um, I've, I've read a lot of studies that the mold itself, uh, the various um, grains, and the hops can actually add more salts uh, to the final beer than the actual water profile. And I'm just wondering, that's very there true. Studies, studies done in that regard. Um, yeah, that's that's a great comment. Um, unfortunately, we don't have published data on final mineral pro profiles of classic beers. You know, um, what we do have are like kind of like winning water profiles going into classic beers. Um, the rest of the brewing process is kind of a black box. Um, and yes, you're right. We, there is a, um, you get calcium from the malts. You get tons of potassium and phosphate from the malts and magnesium, like I said. Um, and all these affect pH and affect the final flavor of the beer. Um, and as you say, we often get really uh in depth with you know classic water profiles trying to target them to you know make the best beer possible and to counter that i have to say remember that brewing is cooking okay we are cooking our wort we are fermenting that wort and everybody's tastes are different you know when it comes to making hungarian stew we're not trying to emulate Hung hungary's water to make that stew. We are adding seasonings to or suit our own tastes. And the same rules apply to brewing with the added caveat that we understand the effects that some of these salts have on pH and how pH can affect the flavor of the beer. And that's kind of why I go to the brew cube, which is very general in its guidelines, but shows you, shows you what those relationships are between salts and flavor. Thanks, John. Uh, I saw Thank I saw you. Rain had a had a question in um, the chat. Uh, Rain, I, I know you can find the hands up button, but feel free to ask your question. Uh, I did I did actually uh, just find it, but I was waiting for a second to be actually available to ask it. Uh, uh, John, you actually started touching on this, and I thought it was very interesting because it was something I was curious about. Is as we um, start working with you know, constructing different minerals in our water. I mean, yeast health and uh, yeast nutrients and so on, and what fights and I mean, the magnesium was a great point there. But uh, if there's anything else that we should be looking out for, uh, that you you know, red flags, I'd love to hear from you. Um. Yeah. Uh, that there's there's it's always kind of safe to say there's more we don't know about it than what we do. Um. We know that magnesium and calcium are important for yeast health and fermentation health um, and good beer appearance. Zinc is another big one. Um, zinc doesn't make it past the true stage in the boil. Um, so if you're doing zinc additions because you're doing yeast repitching, um, you know, rather than buying commercial pitches of yeast, if you're doing your own yeast repitching, you need you you want to add zinc, and that should be done at the fermenter because otherwise it binds too readily to the tube, and doesn't make it into the fermenter if you're doing it during the boil. Um, what other ones are there? Manganese is another trace element that um, 
is important for the hops, but too much manganese has uh, bad flavor effects on the beer. Um, and the hops provide quite a bit of manganese, uh, depending on where they were grown. You know, it just comes from the soil. Um, there are other ions or other minerals, um, chromium, uh, iron, manganese, what else? Copper. Tin. Copper. Um, copper. Copper is a, is a trace element nutrient. Um, a little bit's good, too much is bad. Um, and so um, I think the amount of copper homebrewers typically have in their systems is, is sufficient, um, not going to harm anything. If we were to make our fermenters out of copper, that would probably be a problem. But well, since they're working, fine. Yeah, but right. Well, I got to tell you that zinc thing is actually something I did not know, and uh, that just made the entire evening worth my time because I repitch a lot. Oh, I very good. Thank you. Yep, get a get a zinc sulfate or um, Fermate or one of the other uh, yeast supplements that has zinc. I've tried those, but I've never understood what was in them. I think they were kind of proprietary sounding. So yeah, White Labs makes a good one. Thank you very much. But it doesn't seem like there's a question queued. So I'll ask one of the ones I wrote down during the presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do, an, I do a water presentation every year for our club. And um, something that I started in, uh, in saying recently to try and uh, make it more clear is uh, like removing uh, uh, chlorine in your beer is pretty important. And I, I right. pulled one, one thing out of your book, um, which was how long it would take you to remove chlorine and chlorine using carbon filtration versus Camden tablets. And that's, oh, yeah. what and that's what caused me to start telling people use Camden tablets, even if, even if you're using chart <laughs> carbon filtration, because we have chloramine in our water. And I think it was like a quarter gallon an hour or something was the draw rate. Yeah. Or <laughs> Depends on the size of your carbon, your carbon filter, but yeah. There's, you need quite a bit of dwell time uh, of the water in the carbon filter to actually filter out that chloramine. And it is much faster to simply crush up a Camden tablet and stir it in. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, I, I, very quickly on that thought, I've, I often um, prepare my strike water with the, chlorum, chlor, uh, the Camden tablet and give it a little boil to boil off. Mm -hmm. um, am I wasting my time? Because one of my concerns was that it is dissipating, but then the other minerals I'm adding might go into conflict with it or? No. Um, when you add the metabisulfite to the water, it's going to convert the chlorine and chloramine to chloride mm -hmm. at a you know, couple few ppm. Um, same with uh, sulfite to sulfate, you'll get about 5, 10 ppm a sulfate generated, um, which is in it, because the, the cation is sodium or potassium, it's not, and these are high solubility salts, you're not gonna get any precipitation. It's not gonna affect the dissolution of the other salts you're trying to add. Good, I, I was paranoid. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. I see David Chang saying unmuted himself. David, do you have a question? <laughs> I'm not really able to hear you very well. Maybe you're reading on the wrong mic. There we go. How's that better? Oh, yeah. There yeah, 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 yeah. I had my mic up. I, I had a little, I, I brewed today and I had a little bit of a mistake that I uh, announced in the, uh, in the social chat in our Facebook group. Um, the Camden tablet, I, I've been using so much distilled water for a lot of my beers and building up a profile uh, from distilled uh, that today when I was brewing an Imperial Stout, I, I just was using our, our tap water because it's, it's pretty good for darker beers. Uh, but I neglected to add the Camden tablet prior to, prior to mashing in. So I was already in the middle of sparging and I was like, uh, I guess I'll have to try now and see what happens. So I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about how, what's going to happen because uh, a lot of time, a lot of grain, yeah. right? So, yeah. I, you know, that, that's interesting. I don't know to what extent the chlorophenol, you know, reaction is reversible, um, to what extent the metabisulfite might uh, react with the chlorophenol, you know, what those equilibrium constants are. Um, 
you know, after the fact like that. Excuse me. I know that uh, a lot of breweries in the past have added fair amounts of metabisulfite to the beer as a way to promote flavor stability. Um, and yeah, you know, I, you don't hear uh, about chlorophenols being a problem. So it could be that, you know, maybe it does do double duty uh, or maybe they just didn't have a chlorophenol problem to begin with. Uh, but that's, you know, it'd be interesting to hear from you how that turns out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll know in about 10 days, I guess, right? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Very good. I guess I'll, I'll ask my a second one of my questions. So you had a chart where you showed the pH going, sorry, I guess it goes this yeah. way from this perspective, going down at each yeah. step. And I... Traditionally, I've always just aimed for 5.2 for every beer. And only recently, I started to think about maybe aiming a little higher for dark beers. And mm -hmm. um, I, I was wondering what kind of, if we can assume that there's going to be like a like a linear correlation between our mash pH and our beer pH, even for dark beers, because I thought it was more yeast dependent, where say if you do like a dark beer 5.5 or 5.6 with one yeast strain, it might be 4.1 beer pH, or it might be 4.5 beer pH. No, you're absolutely right. There, there are a lot of factors that affect that pH progression. So all I'm trying to show is that there is a progression and that if you're brewing that same recipe over and over again, you can track that progression as a way to you know, gauge and, and monitor consistency of your, of your beer. Um, yeah, different, different yeast strains um, different brewing conditions will affect that final beer pH significantly. Um, the one thing, the one nice thing I guess, I, or I guess it's, it's a help and a hinder, um, that the fermentation is a great leveler of pH. So you can have two, two different words or the same word at different pH is going into the same, you know, kind of fermentation, same yeast strain and come out at the same beer pH. Um, it really does kind of level that playing field. Um, but yeah, different strains will have different effects. And, but it, it, fortunately, the, the good part of it is that if you are brewing, you know, one recipe and you're saying, hmm, you know, this beer came, the pH is a little low, it's at 4.1, you know, you can raise mash pH a couple tenths. And yes, hopefully, your beer pH will correspondingly rise a couple of tenths as well. So I see we have some question hints coming up. Before that, um, it came up quite a bit in the chat during the presentation, so I thought it'd, it'd be worth mentioning at least. So you mentioned, um, I think it was Eastern Canada that had really hard limestone water, and I thought it would work bringing up that around here, we have something called Guelph water, which everyone makes fun of. Um, oh. <laughs> because Guelph is, is situated on limestone as well, and a lot, all the water there and some of the most famous breweries from Ontario are situated there and they have over 300 parts per, parts per million of uh, bicarbonate. Oh, wow. Oh. And, all, oh. and all, all of the bottled water in our grocery stores, even in Toronto, comes from that region for some reason. <laughs> well, yeah, bottled water, mineral water, you know, that's, that's exactly what you're looking for in a nice, uh, you know, after dinner drink, that high bicarbonate water, settle your yeah. tummy. But uh, for brewing purposes, no, it sucks. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people who find who read online that they should buy their water for their first beer, they buy that water. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's uh... well, well spent trying to get rid of it. <laughs> so uh, I, that's I unfortunate. Thought that be, I thought that would be fun to bring up, since in case you weren't aware, there is some really bad water really close <laughs> to home for brewing. At least. <laughs> that is that's good to know. Uh, so I think Nick, and that's what steam whistle uses. The well yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they probably treat it heavily. <laughs> um, I was gonna say Nick Hadowski was the next one with his hand up. Uh, I, John, feel free to cut these off um, whenever you're done with us. <laughs> oh, that's right. Um, but Nick, you are next, so feel free to go ahead. Uh, hey, John, you were talking about adjusting um, after like post fermentation. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, I've got a uh, a couple of beers here that are the, the hop bite is pretty sharp, and mm, okay. this, these are I kind of want to mellow it out. How would you go about doing that? I guess um, hmm. dosing on a small scale and then 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the best way to start. Yeah. What would your process be for that? Um, if uh, if the hop bite is kind of sharp, I'd check the pH for one thing. You need to you need to degas a sample of the beer. Um, you could boil it or heat it in the microwave to get the gas out. Check the p get cool it down again. Check the pH, see where that is. If it's if it's low, if that's part of the problem, you could add some baking soda. If it's high, um, you know, then you could try adding, you know, some acid, um, either a little bit of lactic or phosphoric are the, the two that are most commonly used. Um, adding chloride to decrease hot bite doesn't work. Um, it's, you really, they're, they're, Sulfate and chloride are not like mutually um, opposing. It's just the one tends to accentuate one better than the other. So yeah, you can't add chloride to decrease hop character. It would increase the malt character. And if you have a sufficiently malty beer, that help might, might help bring the hop and malt characters into balance. But um, yeah, otherwise to decrease a hop character is kind of difficult short of massively oxidizing the beer. Okay, no, that's super helpful, actually. I think that would work, adding a bit of chloride. It is a, supposed to be multi beers, so thank you oh, very okay. much. You're welcome. Sorry, I forgot I was muted. I think uh, Ron was the next one with his hand up. Uh, so Ron, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, uh, with regard to the Camden tablet, um, I know most of the tablets are sodium metabisulfite. I tend to use potassium metabisulfite powder because I just have a bag of it left over from when I used to make wine many, many years ago. Uh, does it really make a difference or is there any concerns of using a different one? Um, you know, I've read that if you use potassium metabisulfite, um, it tends, the, the effect of potassium metabisulfite on the body tends to make uh, your hair uh, drier, uh, tends to stick up more. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I don't know of any differences between the two. And, and in, in terms of tannin, obviously you're, you're adding uh, salt into the water. I assume that it's insignificant in terms of the quantities. Like yes. people don't really worry about it. Yeah, you're, you're talking about 10 ppm, which remember anything less than 50 ppm is a low concentration. If you go to the grocery store and buy distilled water, you're probably buying water that still has anywhere from five to 10 ppm of sodium and chloride and you know their trace ions, you know, they're all in this very low concentration. So, you know, the unless you put in like five Camden tablets, you know, one per gallon, you would before you'd start, you know, getting any um, adverse character. And high sulfite, metabisulfite, high sulfite characters in beer can tend to give you that, um, that burnt match or struck match kind of aroma from beer. Um, that can be an issue. But uh, otherwise, no, there's really no issues with adding bisulfite. Thank you. Sure. I think Max was next, and I'm going to lower your hand, Ron. Um, so Max, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Um, thanks. So you had mentioned um, that in Toronto, you guys are using chloramines um, instead of just chlorine or in addition to chlorine. And I'm out in Oakville, so I don't know if there's a difference that we're using different chemical treatment for the same kind of water source. Um, I'm wondering, using the water report, is there some other name for chloramines that I might find? Because, you know, I, I was using the technique that I'd read about and how to brew about just off gassing the water for a day for chlorine. And still like some beers were turning out great, other beers weren't turning out great. I'm, and I just recently went to uh, Toronto Brewing and got myself some Camden tablets to try that out. Um, so I'm gonna see what there's a difference, but should I be expecting a difference if it's just chlorine and I'm off gassing? Will I get a more consistent brew out of this? If you have chlorine as your disinfectant, uh, you probably won't taste any real difference between the two. If it's chloramine instead, you'll probably notice a difference 
in a cleaner, less plasticky tasting or Band-Aid tasting uh, character. It could be subtle. Um, the, um, yeah, on the water report, you would, it could be that they'll, they'll just say, you know, what is the residual chlorine? Because that is the, usually the, the guideline or the requirement is, you know, you don't, you won't, don't want to exceed four ppm of residual chlorine, whether they add ammonia to that to make it chlorine or not, they may not say. Okay, I, I've got chlorine free, chlorine total and chlorine combined on my water report. And I'm not sure if that is a hint that there is chloramine on there or not. I, I think we'd have to ask for, for Toronto, it says total chlorine residual and then in brackets, it says chloramine. So uh, Toronto, Toronto's pretty open in saying that it's chloramine. Um, but for Oakville or Peel region in general, uh, I'm not too sure. Yeah, you'd have to call the utility and ask. It's probably yeah. chloramine. Okay, thanks. And I know. I know. We, so we we actually had the, one of the engineers from Toronto Water come into our meeting in January of this past year before we all got sent home, and um, she was explaining that they, the reason, the main reason they do chloramine is because of how far they have to pump their water. And, and I don't know how far Oakville pumps your water, um, but I know for Toronto, our water gets pumped all the way up through York region, like up almost like Markham and Richmond Hill and stuff. So right, uh, we have different water processing plants for the different municipalities in Halton. So I'm wondering if maybe this one's just for us. It, it could be, yeah. You know, it, Toronto's been very good to us. Whenever I email them, um, I get the engineers sending me back like the water report from the previous week. Um, Oh, and we cool. post it on our website. So I, I think if if, you, if they're if they're good out to you out there, um, we can we can share it or you can share it on. Um, yeah, I'll have uh, to build up that rapport with the. Yeah. 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 Just take my beer; they'll be happy. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. You did this. <laughs> so I think R R Rain was the next one with the hand up. Um, so I'll I'll give Rain the the reins. <laughs> uh, I almost forgot my question because it's got interesting. Um, uh, actually, the chloramide thing, you're absolutely right. It's not just about how far they pipe it. It's about stability in the pipes. And uh, the, the, they call it the liability of stuff sitting in the system. And somebody did tell me that um, if you're in areas where the water sits a long time in systems, even in some rural areas, they like chloramide because it doesn't break down with the, the pipes themselves. So. But um, now I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Uh, oh, yes. Um, the talk about using Camden tablets and so on. Uh, I, was I was curious when you suggested that that could be used either post mash, perhaps in the boil, post boil. Because as I understand from a, from a, like a, a vintner's perspective, uh, this stuff is used to, as a yeast toxin. So I would imagine you wouldn't want to put it into cold wort. You'd want it to be at least boiled off before you put it into fermenter or am I overreacting? No, no, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, the, the, well, it's, again, it, it, there's two factors that make it an effective uh, disinfectant for wine. And one is the low pH of the must and also the concentration. I think, I think we're using low, much lower concentrations of sulf but might by sulfite uh, in beer than they do in wine one and also the of course the ph of the mash or the water in the mash you know anywhere from seven down to five is still higher than the ph of the must although i'm not sure what the ph of the must is i think it's four and a half but i may be wrong okay now i just uh, i I always thought of it as a poison that you wanted to get rid of before. You yeah, but the that effect depends on concentration and pH. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. So, Ken, I, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have a question as well? Oh, no, sorry. I was uh, commenting on something earlier. Um, can I share a water report, though? Can I sure. share screens or? Sure. Yeah. To share a screen. You have, you have the, the water expert. Ready to look at your water report, I guess. Let's see, we're here. Let's share that. And it's not showing up. Oh, there we go. I see it. You do? Yep. 
the what? Where is this from? This is from a groundwater source local to us in Gormley, Ontario, and very hard water. Oh, there you go. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, alkalinity 225, 227. Yeah, that's high. Um, hardness 273. Yeah, that's medium. Um, you divide 273 by 50, the equivalent weight. And so that's roughly, you know, five and a half equivalents. You assume that in any given water, there's three times as much calcium as there is magnesium. Oh yeah, and so now, yeah, down here is your calcium and magnesium amounts. Yeah, medium amount of calcium at 83. You know, that's, that's a good level to have. Medium amount of magnesium at 15, that's good to have. Um, I don't have any issues with your hardness. Okay, good to know. Yeah, the alkalinity at 225 though is high. And that's that's something you'd want to bring down with acid additions. Okay, yeah, I'm typically doing that. So it doesn't take much, but yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, and it's harder to. I always find it's harder to bring that back once you've gone too far with it. It's like it takes tons of yeah, yeah, whatever um, powder to bring that yeah. back. That's right. Yeah, baking soda yeah. will affect the mash pH, but it takes Dip twenty them. minutes or so. Gypsum, I've been uh, countering not with, but I get scared sometimes. I over, I've, I've done that before. I've overcompensated with the, the pH and then tried to bring it back with gypsum. I'm like, oh, this, nah. Oh yeah, well, gypsum won't won't bring the pH back up. Ah. Bake, baking soda will. But... Well, okay, yeah, I've done that, and that definitely did uh, had yeah. higher effects on it. So, yeah. okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And I'm not sure how to unmute the, how to take myself off. Eric, you want to take that back over? Uh, stop you from sharing? Yeah, how do I? I, I, I can do that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so if, I, if, I, if I'll ask one of my last questions and then see if, we are, see if we're hitting the end or not. Um, so I guess I, I've read in a few places that um, calcium chloride that you buy, um, especially if you have it sitting around in your brewery for a few years while you use it up, can uh, absorb water. And the amount mm -hmm. that you're adding um, may not actually be what you think you're adding. I was wondering how a real of a concern that is, and if I need to, if I, if I actually need to take it seriously, that I should be baking my calcium chloride, or can I keep being lazy? You can keep being lazy. Yeah, um, yeah. With time, it'll absorb water, and if you note it clumping up or turning solid, then it's absorbed quite a bit. Um, so you could bake it at that point to re reduce the water content but it's it doesn't absorb water as badly as uh as magnesium chloride or what's the other one calcium hydroxide i think also uh absorbs water quite a bit of water so, so if it still looks like little pellets it's probably okay yeah yeah that's good I thought of and, and, <laughs> and all you're doing you know is you're adding a few grams of water to your your weight and so you're not you're not over salting. You're maybe under salting a little bit, but that's hardly a huge concern. That's that's all the questions I I think I should probably be asking. And uh, seems like there's no more questions coming up. So I guess I, I think we can call it. So, okay. Uh, th thank thank you very much, John, for c coming and taking the time to sit down with us and teach us all the ways about water. Um, definitely be going to be looking at your app. I'm looking forward to that. I assume okay. it has both Android and iPhone, right? Yes. Yes. All right. That's good. Yeah. Well, you. it's a real pleasure seeing you all again. And, I, uh, I have a personal re a request is that the next time you run a publishing run of uh, one of your books, make a big coffee table version because the two I've bought so far have walked off to other people and like a <laughs> <the> third one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell the publisher that. That's a great idea. It'd be something I could chain down. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, right. thanks again, y'all. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, or I guess three hours ago from here. <laughs> yep, I'm going to go eat dinner now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, John. Pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>